Hello, and welcome to another edition of WaveLab Workflows. My name is Justin Perkins. Today, we're going to be going over how to assemble a DDP in WaveLab Pro. And for those that don't know, a DDP file is something that's typically used to send off for CD pressing. It can also be used for approving a master. I think a DDP with a DDP player is a great way to have your clients listen to your mastering work in a dedicated player that is less likely to screw up the audio in terms of the sound quality and the song spacing and all that kind of stuff. But the basic point of a DDP is for sending it off for CD production. You know, a folder of WAV files is not a CD master. The songs need to be in a specific order, specific spacing, CD text, ISRC codes can be added, all sorts of stuff that goes into making a CD master. And depending on your clientele, you know, maybe you're not doing a lot of albums, maybe you're doing a lot of singles, but DDPs are still pretty popular in my um, experience. People are still pressing CDs to sell at concerts, um, all sorts of stuff. So CDs haven't died out. And someone asked me this, but a lot of my workflow... I've shown how to make a DDP before, but not directly. So this video is going to be focusing just on the DDP creation process. Let's say you've processed your files and you just need to make a DDP. I'm actually going to show three different ways of doing it. One way is going to be if you have your files perfectly processed, trimmed, edited, all you need to do is essentially turn the folder of WAV files into a DDP. I'm going to show it again using a method that where you have to trim up the files and do some sequencing, getting the songs in order, doing the song spacing, things like that. And then I'm going to show a final time how to do a DDP from higher sample rate files, because sometimes I see people, they have their 96K um, wave masters and they need to make a DDP and there's a few ways to do it but I'll show you how I would do it in wave lab in that situation um, as mentioned my whole workflow revolves around a way where making a DDP is not a big deal because you've already done the detail work it's as simple as pressing a button but um, and, and for example I'll show you um, what I mean by that so this would have been a project that I um, assembled in Wave Lab. I already did all my markers work, as you can see. Um, this project didn't have ISRC codes, but I could have added it. I did all the detail work already. Everything's nicely laid out. The client approved it. I did some fades. Um, and then, of course, I render that to a new montage to lock in the processing at 96K. I do an external sample rate conversion of that to get a 44.1K version. I'll just skip to this one. So as you can see at this point, you know, if the client approves this, I have to press maybe two buttons and I have a DDP file ready to go. Um, so like I said, my workflow kind of revolves around being able to prepare anything, any kind of file that's going to be needed for a project. The DDP doesn't have to be this extra step that's painful to do if you, if you I think, work in a, a smarter way. Uh, you know, thinking ahead by getting all the markers laid out and actually showed you a different project, but that's okay. So this would be the 96K version. This would be the 44.1 version with the 16-bit dither running. But long story short is I, I haven't really focused on doing a DDP specifically because it's already kind of baked into my workflow. From this montage, I could render 16-bit waves, you know, 16-bit 44.1 waves of each song I could make a DDP and I wouldn't have to do anything different or think about it because everything's been done and it's I think a great way to work but again I see a lot of people that need to make a DDP from existing files for whatever reason and we're going to focus on again the three ways of doing that one way would be you have your processed waves that are already 16-bit already 44.1k sample rate Nothing needs to happen except creating the DDP, and then we'll, we'll kind of do a few other scenarios. And just to clarify, a DDP is more technically called the DDP file set. So you're going to see that when I make this DDP, it's going to create a folder. And in that folder is going to be a handful of files. I did a... Uh, let me just uh, skip to one that has one. So 
This is actually a DDP file set. It's a bunch of files, a CD text file, a checksum, the image.dat file is actually all the audio, and there's files that know where the markers go. All this stuff is technically called the DDP file set. So just, just to be sure, and in case I forget to mention it later, we always zip up the DDP folder into a zip file so that we, when we transmit it, to the CD pressing plant or to the client, none of these files get lost because I've had people ask me, you know, which file do I upload to the CD plant, you know, and I have to say you upload the whole zip file, you know, it needs, all those files need to be there. They're there for a reason. Um, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, some browsers are set to unzip or open what it considers safe file. So I've had situations where clients download their zipped DDP file set and their computer thinks it's helping by unzipping that and throwing away the zip, and then they get confused about what to send to the pressing plant. So I always have in my email template that they need you need to you know make sure your browser is not unzipping the zip file. They need the whole zip file. We'll get into all that. But now that I see a few people are here, um, I'm going to kind of get into the the scenarios of of making a DDP, and I'll start with I'll start with the situation where because this happens a lot with other people that are just getting into WaveLab or coming to it for the first time, or they don't use it very often. They have their, you know, they have what they consider their master files, but they need to make this DDP that they're stressing out about. And again, if you, I think if you use WaveLab in a smarter way, you don't, it's not a stress point at all. It's just two buttons, but I'm going to make a new montage. And in this case, it's going to be a 44.1 K sample rate montage. Um, and I use a lot of shortcuts when I'm really working. So forgive me if I'm a little slow in finding the actual buttons. I want to show you the actual buttons for those that aren't familiar with the shortcuts, but just know that you can do this stuff a whole lot faster with shortcuts when you have your shortcuts memorized and you're not trying to explain it in words. So I'm going to create a new audio montage. And by default, um, I have a preference and wave lab set up to create a 96 K montage, which is not what we want here. So I'm going to, you can go to file new audio montage. You can go, you you'd want to be stereo. And in this case that I'm going to show you, you'd want to be 44.1 K sample rate. And if anyone has any questions, feel free. I'm going to keep an, a better eye on the chat today than usual, because it's a unique topic, but I'm going to create this montage. That's how you would do it. I'm going to step back one more time and create it from my montage template because I like to have my metadata preset loaded. And if you want to know more about that, watch the metadata one. So needless to say, I've created this 44.1K sample rate montage. If you're unsure, you can look in the lower right corner and see the sample rate of the montage. Now, you'll notice that it's not specifying a bit depth. That's because montages don't have a bit depth. They're bit depth agnostic. They process audio and floating point. They can handle any bit depth. So you never have to set the bit depth when you create a montage. You do have to be careful of the bit depth when you are rendering your final files because that's when it starts to matter. So I've created the 44.1K audio montage. I'm going to insert some files. And again, I have a very good shortcut for this. Uh, import is not what we want. We want file. Um, I'll tell you what, if you're using the default shortcuts for uh, WaveLab, it's Shift-Command-I, and I've shortened it to just Command-I with my settings, because I do it all the time. So Command-I is going to bring up this window, and it's going to ask you for your files. So I'm going to go, I prepared some files for this, and we'll go with the perfectly prepped files. There's a lot of them. Um, so I'm going to load these in. I select all 18 songs. And you can see I've named these perfectly. They have a numeric prefix. The, the titles are all perfect. This is how I'd want to present it. And that's going to come in handy when we get to some CD text. But uh, long story short, when you insert files into a montage, you get a few options of tracks or lanes. You can stagger the files on two alternating tracks or lanes. In this case, since I'm going to be doing no editing, nothing, I'm going to do CD. I'm going to use tracks because it's not going to matter. And I'm going to line them all up on one track so they just go like that. Now, I should have showed you that if you, for some reason, 
need to adjust the song order that you want them to be inserted in, you can um, use shortcuts or drag the mouse to rearrange the song order, like if this one was supposed to be first, and all this stuff. It's very quick to rearrange the song order that happens before you um, drag them in, or before it drops them in. But if your files are nicely named with a numeric prefix, they're going to come in that order, especially if you have a two-digit numeric prefix like 01. Some programs and files don't like if you just have a 1 without the 0 leading, because then it goes from 1 to 11, to, it gets all screwed up. So anyways, this is how I would do it to get my files into the montage, and because they're so nicely named, I don't have to edit anything or, or tweak anything. So this would be a good time to save it. And I have naming schemes that you, if you watch my other videos, you, I have better naming schemes. Um, today I'm going to make something up off the top of my head. I'll call it Perfect, and you can see my test run, Perfect DDP Album 1 DDP. For whatever reason, that's what I'm going to call it, just to save it. Um, naming your montage a certain way can help with downstream processes such as rendering, which you'll see in my other videos, but today I'm just... I'm doing something I honestly don't normally do because, as I mentioned, the way I work, this would already be done prior to, you know, the client would have, you know, the, the master that I send to my client, all this stuff's done, and then if they, once they approve it, I can just render a DDP of what they've approved, and it's done in less than a minute because there's no processing to, you know, there's no plug-in processing to render. It's already done. So anyways, let's get on to this. So now we have a montage with all the songs and if you go to the clips tab you can get a better idea of what's going on um, but again I'm this one I'm going to show you right now I'm assuming that you've maybe you've used Cubase or Pro Tools or Logic and you've created your files the exact length you want them they sound how you want they're already 16-bit in fact when I play this and show you the bit depth meter of WaveLab you can see it's 16-bit so this is literally like the easiest, simplest method of making a DDP where no changes to the audio need to happen. So we have our files there. And again, the song spacing is baked into the um, files. If you look, I got a little bit of a buffer here before the first note. These two songs actually crossfade into each other. Um, these songs have a true silence. You can actually see my dither noise because I'm zoomed way in. So, anyways, I don't have to do any song. Here's another two songs that kind of go into each other. I'm not going to adjust the audio in any way. But I do need to make some track markers for each song. So, one thing, the next thing you would do, again, I have really fast shortcuts for all this, but I like to use the CD Wizard to generate the markers for each song. You can do them one by one. It's very painful, especially for 18 songs or whatever this is. So in the CD tab, we have the CD wizard, which you can call up with the shortcut or press that button. And because I have some stuff already saved, some presets and whatnot, you know, my montage preset is exists for a reason. It also has the CD wizard set up just how I like it. And how I like it is to generate CD track markers, create markers at clip boundaries, use splice markers, which I think is a big deal. Um, create markers at crossfade points doesn't really apply to this because all the files are butted up back to back but if you just want to pause it on this and you can see my settings um, if I did have ISRC codes it could be a time to add them let me just open up my document and grab a generic code let's just grab this one starts with a one um, you could pop in the first code if your codes are all sequential you could put in the first code and it's going to go increase the number by one digit if your codes are all over the place um, then you can manually enter them in the cd tab which i'll show you um, you can also enter the upc which is usually provided by the record label or client and paste it in there if you have one i don't happen to have one handy so i'm not going to do it but that's a place to do it or you can do it in a later time but basically this is how i want it um, and again, this is my preset, and I'm going to press Apply, and it just created a marker for each song. And you'll notice it created it. The reason it created it at the start of each file perfectly is because these 
these files were already quantized to CD frames. So you have to be careful if, you're, if your files aren't quantized to a CD frame and you do what I did, because um, as you'll see, I had the quantize thing on. You don't have to do that right now, but when you render the DDP, it's going to force quantize. The marker has to be on a CD frame. So you may as well get ahead of that and know where it's going to quantize to. So if I hadn't, already, these are files I already mastered and rendered, so everything's quantized. But if you didn't quantize, you may see with that quantize setting that your marker is offset from the start of the file by maybe a few milliseconds. And that's okay. Again, better to see it and know what's going to happen than have it happen when you make the DDP and never really see it. So just be aware of that. If you're, if you're using the quantize button and your markers are not landing right on the clip, that's that's actually correct. Um, these just happen to be files that I already rendered from a quantized montage. So everything's right on the right on the start of the file. Now this is something I didn't quite think about, but um, you basically want your markers to be perfect because we're going to get into some CD text real quick. You want your markers to be perfectly named what the song titles are. And as you can see, because these are files I've rendered from WaveLab or it could be from another program. Some people put numeric prefixes on their files just to keep them in order, you know, in your Mac Finder or Windows or whatever. Um, but we don't want these 0102 in the marker names because um, we don't want that to be part of the CD text. And I do happen to have uh, a batch renaming preset called numeric prefix Renew removal. And luckily I have it because I kind of forgot about it. But basically it turns these markers into this and it's a pretty advanced tool but i have a preset that just takes care of the numeric prefix so that cleans up the marker names to be just the song titles as we want them and that's going to come in handy shortly because um again we're not touching the audio this is more of an administrative process at this point if, if the audio is finalized obviously i know these files are great because i did them the other day and went through them, but you can quickly use shift and the right parenthesis or the zero key to kind of check your marker placements and just kind of make sure everything's kosher. Um, and again, I made splice markers. That means it's an end marker and a start marker glued together. And if you move, they, they move as one. I don't like to use the end and start marker because then you have, it creates a big mess. Um, we basically want one track to end and the next one to start. We don't want any negative time in this situation. So I know that everything's good, but you obviously would want to go through and, and check that everything looks, you can zoom the waveform real huge and just see what's going on. Everything's looking good. Again, those songs run together on purpose. So do those. We're, we're good. Um, it's not required to add CD text to a DDP, but that's one feature of a DDP. You know, when people put the CD in their car stereo, car stereos are a great place to actually check CD text. Um, there's a bit of a tangent, but your computer, when you open up Apple Music or Windows Media Player, it does not read the CD text directly unless you have a special extension or script. Um, when you put your CD into a computer it looks up the cd information using grace note database it looks at the number of songs and how long each one is and tries to find a match that's why if you put a cd in your computer that you've burned yourself it may come up with some crazy suggestions for what it might be um, cd text is different it's information embedded right on the actual disc and again a car stereo is a great place car stereos usually display cd text um, and maybe some other fancy home stereo CD players. Anyways, we want to enter CD text because we can. Um, so in the CD tab, um, again, this is where you could modify your ISRC codes if they were, sometimes the artist gives you codes and they're all scrambled, different numbers. It's a big mess. You can manually, you can even double click on this to see it all better. Um, that's where you would manu manually copy and paste in or edit the right codes, but we'll say that this is a nice new album and the codes are in perfect order. Um, you could enter the UPC up here. Um, and again, if you're in the US, we usually just have 12 digits, so you add a zero first and then 
paste the other 12 digits. Um, but the CD tab is a good thing to look at for what's going on. We're going to enter the CD text now. Um, this is where I talked about my montage name coming in handy. I'm going to copy it. My shortcut is Control N to copy just the montage name. Uh, I believe you can do that as well. Uh, but the reason being, typically I go artist name dash album title. And again, this is going to be something kind of weird um, for today's purposes. But the shortcut that I've created for CD text editor is Shift and T. But of course, in the CD tab, you can press this button here, Edit CD Text. That's going to bring up the CD text editor. And the first page of the CD text editor is the album page. So that's where you'd want to enter. We'll say that, you know, this is generic thing. So the album title is just going to be called album one. And the performer name is going to be perfect DDP. And so again, the first page is for the album. You can press page down or use the scroll bar to look at each track. And as you can see, each track is empty. Now you can also do songwriter, composer. I don't typically get into that unless it's classical or jazz. Most clients just care about the performer and the titles, maybe the songwriter, if you have the information. Um, so my point is I can use this button here to push the performer name, which is the artist name to every track in one click. And if you hover long enough, it'll tell you that. So now you can see, I just pushed the performer name to every song, which is handy. Now, when you're working for real, you don't have to always check. You can just check everything at once, but you'll notice that these are grayed out. We don't want to push the album title to every song that's already got that. But if you scroll to song one or track one, it calls it, you can do it one by one with this button. But if you press this button, it's going to take those perf. That's why it's important to get your markers name perfect. I never rename the clips because I want the clips to have the true name of the file. I rename the marker names to be exactly how the song title needs to be because renaming the markers is going to help with file rendering when you do waves of each song and metadata. That's a whole nother topic, but get your file, get your marker names perfectly named to the song title. Cause then you can just press this button and now your CD text is the exact name of every song. You can double check it by using page up and down and scrolling through, make sure there's no spaces after the, you know, you don't want to have a space at the end and blank spaces can cause trouble later. You want to make sure everything's kosher and then you can press OK. And now if you look at the CD tab, sometimes I, we got CD text. We have artist name, song title. You can, again, you can do more if you want to get into the details of songwriter, composer, arranger, things like that. So now we have our CD text and we're basically ready to render the DDP. If I am not forgetting anything, um, just double checking my notes. There are some strange quirks that I'll show you in real life about um, sometimes when I copy a title that has an apostrophe in it, if it's copied from a, a weird um, font or usually, I don't know if it's Windows people or what, but sometimes if I get a, sometimes the apostrophe will appear as a question mark in the CD text. And that's because it's a strange format apostrophe. And all I do is delete that and manually type in apostrophe. And part of that is because we're restricting the CD text to ASCII. Um, it's not, as you can see, you can uncheck that and you can roll the dice, but CD text in theory has a limited character set, meaning if you have accents, which is kind of a pain for, for Latin music and other languages, but it, as you can see, we basically have Western European and Japanese for our language choices. You know, it's, it's not fair to all languages, but it is what it is. So CD text, you can turn this off and put your accents and your special characters. There's a really good chance that the CD player and any software downstream is not going to display those characters. So I tend to keep my CD text safe as far as characters. And I use this. So anytime you see a question mark that wasn't meant to be there in the CD text, that means it had a illegal character that it was can't display. So it puts a question mark there for you to see. Um, and again, you can, this is getting a little off track too, but I, you can put special characters in the actual metadata when you render your waves. 
And that's part of why I keep my marker names true to the song title, any special characters, accents, all that stuff. Then when I do the CD text editing, if any characters are not in the ASCII um, limit or range, then I can manually tweak them here just for the CD text so there's no CD text problems. And then the CD text is actually how I name the files because we also don't want to have file names with strange characters because that could be fine locally on your computer. It can cause problems downstream with certain you know, distribution services or PC users, um, you know, Windows is more strict with characters and file names. So you really want to keep your, if you're rendering waves and MP3s, you want to keep those file names pretty safe and simple too. Um, again, the, the metadata is where you can have less limitation. But since we're focusing on DDP and not metadata, I'm going to get off that topic. So anyways, everything's correct. Um, because the files were 16-bit already, there's no need to dither. As you're going to see in my future demonstrations, if I were to add a fade out to this song, you'll see that the bit depth increases. So it's 16 bit, everything's fine, but watch what happens when that fade starts. Now we have floating point audio. So if you were to make a DDP, you would either need to dither to 16 bit or just let that be truncated and it sounds how it sounds. Could sound a little grainy if you really listen closely. That's kind of why. Doing it this way creates a, a big mess because if you've reduced your audio to 16-bit but you still want to do fades or cross-fades or even if you tweak the level a little bit, like if I want to turn the song down a, a half a dB, now we have floating point audio, which is not the end of the world. But um, again, that's why I just do my all my mastering in WaveLab because then I can be in control of the bit depth from start to finish and there's no double dithering or truncation or anything weird like that. So again, this, this example is simply for, you, you're not going to touch the audio in any way. You're just adding markers, adding CD text, uh, maybe obviously listening again and proofing everything, but you're not, the audio is not being altered in any, any way at all. Everything's set to zero, no fades, nothing. So I, I was just showing you how with the bit depth meter, you can, and it's up here if you can't find it. You can verify the, the bit depth. Because again, the montage has no bit depth. It's 64-bit um, floating point I have it set to, which is pretty high precision. And then we handle the, the bit depth when we render our files. And in this, this case, I don't need to dither to 16-bit because these files already were. And I'm showing you this because a lot of people work that way. They use Pro Tools or Cubase. They, assemble, they get their files ready that way. And they're simply using WaveLab to make the DDP um, and letting the other files be what they are, even if there could be some slight complications. Um, I do like my new speakers, but the, that's very off topic, so I'm not going to get into that. They're great. Um, so I, I think we're ready to render this DDP. I mean, you always want to remember to check the final marker. It's easy to forget that. I mean, you wouldn't want to have this file have an extra five seconds on it, unless you really want that. But don't forget to check your last marker and make sure that it, you have a proper ending. Um, again, I use shortcuts for all this stuff, but if you are ready to render the DDP, you can go to this disk button and brings up this window. And I don't have a CD burner attached to this um, computer. If I did, you would see you know, my CD burner. All we're gonna do is render a DDP. As you can see, I did a little test, but um, I'll do it. I'll try to do a real world demonstration here. Um, I don't have my right folder structure set up because I'm just kind of making it up here, but we'll just call it uh, perfect. DDP is the artist name. I believe in, as you can see from my other videos, I have a very strict file naming structure and I'm having a hard time not following it with this mock up project, but we'll call it album one. Then I would call it DDP. Because you want wh you want whoever you're sending this to to be able to tell what it is. You know, that's, to me, you know, if my band name was called Perfect DDP and it was, the album title was Album 1, I would know what I'm looking at here. So we're going to create that folder. And once that folder path is created, and it's kind of handy when you're working, because when you're working, you can use this as a starting point or a jumping off point. You know, you could select that and just tweak some some characters in this name you know this folder isn't created but as soon as i hit okay 
the DDP is going to render. It's going pretty fast because it doesn't have to do any processing of plugins or anything. Um, it's pretty great. So let's go see what happened. It's finishing up, but when it's done, it will say DDP successfully created. It gives you some stats. You can just press OK. You could import the result as a new montage to check it out. I would maybe do that if I was doing more processing and not live on a video here, but um, I want to speed things along here, but that is an option. So let's go see what we got here. We have uh, a folder, and as I mentioned, there's eight files. So when people say I need a DDP file, it's really called the DDP file set. We have the CD text info, and I don't even, uh, to be honest with you, I, don't, I couldn't give you a, a speech on what every file in here is for, but this is what it creates. And again, the image.dat, you'll see that's the most data. That's, how big is that? 700. And actually, I should have talked about that. Um, this is pretty long. Um, it, it could fit on a CD. You know, CDs traditionally had a 74-minute limit. Um, you can go up to 80 minutes if you sign a waiver that says, I'm not going to complain if my CDs have problems playing after 74 minutes, but 80 minutes is really, really the max. But anyways, you can see this file, the image.dat file, that's the one that contains the audio. You can't do anything with it, but that's, my whole point is they need all of this, so we typically zip it up to send off to our clients. And speaking of sending it off to our clients, Steinberg has a free DDP player app, which I'll show you. Because a lot of people, they make a DDP, but they, they may not be confident of what they just created. Um, especially if you're just starting out, you might not be confident in what you created, so you want a way to test it. Especially, it's nice to get out of WaveLab and test it, get a second opinion on it. Um, so this is the Steinberg DDP, DDP player. It's free on the Steinberg website, which is great for you. And you can also have your clients download and install the DDP player, and then you can send them the DDP zip file, you know, via Dropbox or WeTransfer or whatever you like to use. Um, my only annoyance with the, uh, actually it does have a menu system, great. So I'm going to go to open. I just installed it, so, because um, to be honest with you, I use a different DDP player because I like my clients to be able to burn a CD and not have to install it. I'll get into that later, but I can select the whole, the, the main folder and press open. And now it's going to open the DDP in this player, and you can play with the column sizes, and you can press play. And you can get a little bit of metering, and of course you can kind of skip around like a virtual CD player. So that's kind of cool for your clients to approve, you know, where the song spacing, because if you listen through it, if you start with track one and just listen through, you know, you're going to get the, the CD experience of, because... The DDP file is what the CDs are going to be made from. So they're going to get the true experience of, you know, especially like I showed you, some of those songs crossfaded. So, like, they can listen to that and make sure the crossfade is smooth. There's no glitch or hiccup. And that they also like when they skip to track, the crossfaded track, that they like where it starts because, you know, there's no absolute perfect pl place to have the track marker when you have overlapping songs. There's, um, anyway, so the Steinberg DDP player is cool. Um, if you need a DDP player, it does let you export or your client export each track as a wave. You can, of course, choose your audio interface. Um, you can decide which columns you're seeing and which ones you're not. So um, that's basically how you make a DDP. I'm going to show you a few more ways, though, that you may be interested in if you have a more complex situation where stuff needs editing or sample rate conversion and things like that. But I'm just checking my notes. Um, I did show the DDP player, mentioned the apostrophe set uh, issues. Yeah, so let's do one where we have to move some stuff around and do a little more assembly work, because that was kind of an easy one, even though we're almost a half hour into this, because I was talking a lot. Um, that's a, it's a very fast process to just load in the files, make the markers, enter the CD text, um, make the DDP, you're good to go. Um, so that's, I just wanted to show a really simple way of doing that, but that's not always a real life situation. I'm going to still work at 44.1. 
I'm going to load in some files that purpose that purposely have some apostrophes we're going to have to, to deal with. Um, and they're also, in fact, these are not even mastered. We're going to pretend that, well, I guess I'm not sure what we're going to pretend, but let's say we need to pick the song order. Again, you can hold command and use the up and down arrow to move the files. You can use the arrows just to select it. Um, in this case, I'll show you, and, and th this is what I would do in real life, but I would use, use lanes and I would stagger on two alternating lanes because um, that's how I really like to assemble albums when, when there's actual, actual work to be done. The one I just showed you, I knew that the files just go back to back, so I just used one big track. Um, in this case, I'm going to use one track, but two lanes. So we'll say that that is the song order. Um, we'll do six songs. We'll use these settings. And it's going to pop the files in there. And again, i got to save it right away. I'll call this um, Untrimmed will be our band name. DDP Assembly Time will be um, the album title for whatever reason. So let's say you have these files and you've, let's just pretend that they're mastered sonically, basically. Um, and as you can see, these are 24-bit files, so we're going to need to do some dithering. And if we do any processing, like even adding a plug-in with a little bit of a tweak, the audio goes up to floating point. So we've got to manage that. Um, delete that for now. But let's say these need a little bit of work because, you know, we're happy with how they sound, but they're not arranged in any particular way at all um, as far as the spacing between songs. In fact, this is, um, this is a little count-in. Um, actually, a different song has a count in, but we'll, let's say, you know, this is some rustling around noise that we want to trim off and do a nice little fade in. I typically like to have the first sound or audio be around 200 milliseconds, you know, so that when we hit start on the record, there's a little 200 millisecond buffer there for, and sometimes I'll do more of it to classical or jazz. It can get close to over a half second or sometimes even a full second. I've had clients want a full second of a breath before the album kicks in. There's no, there's no standard there. So let's say, you know, we did that and I'm listening and I'm going to, you know, there's a little rustling here, some just room tone that we got to fade out. I'm, I'm doing really generic stuff here, but I'm listening and saying, okay, that song's fading out. Uh, but came in too quickly. I'm going to slide this over. I'm going to say the song timing feels good, but you know we do have this little bit of something there. Um, I like to just get rid of that in case it starts to get louder later. Um, and I'm listening to how that maybe that trails on too long. Do a little fade out. So basically, I'm assembling the songs. I know I've showed this before in other videos. There's kind of a little thing that doesn't need to be there. A little. Uh, sound that maybe didn't get noticed in mixing so just assembling the songs so that it flows correctly again not caring about track markers you know this song i happen to know it has some talking at the front and let's say the client said yeah we don't want that talking anymore so we're gonna trim that so it just starts with a vocal count in of one two three four and we'll say that that's a good amount of spacing i'll try to speed through the rest of these but to me it's an important part of mastering is figuring out the flow between songs and what stuff needs to be there this is a song that had some talking at the end and again some clients may want to keep it but let's say they decide to take that out we can trim it easily and do a little fade and get rid of this count in i'd say they want to keep this count in whatever so that's all feeling good. And of course, don't forget your last song, the end of the last song. You want to make sure that has a smooth ending. So let's say we're happy with how this sounds. Um, everything's flowing correctly. You know, we could say, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm giving a mastering demonstration or just DDP. Uh, let's keep it to just DDP. Um, I don't want to get into any plugin processing right now. I just kind of wanted to show a situation where songs need fades and trimming and then markers because that's probably a pretty real scenario too where you've 
you haven't really cleaned up the heads and tails or thought about the song order and the flow and stuff like that. So that's kind of what we're doing now, but we're not going to add any, you know, EQ or limiting because it already sounds how we want. We're just, so again, we want to make, use the CD wizard to make track markers. Let me just show you what happens when I don't use splice markers. Um, cause I always just say to use it and don't say why. If I don't use splice markers, it creates an end marker at the end of that clip. And then it creates a start marker at the start of that one, which you might think is fine, but I think that can lead to problems because if you don't, if you think bigger picture, if you think bigger picture, when you go to render a wave of each song, you have to make sure you include the pause after the track. A lot of people forget that. Then when you render your track by track waves, you're actually omitting this amount of time and then suddenly your songs are too close together. It's just, I see really no reason to use this kind of marker. It's kind of an old concept. So again, that's why I use the splice markers. It's kind of what they're there for. Um, so when I make my markers, everything is right on, you know, there's an end marker and a start marker. And generally speaking, there's no rules, but generally speaking, we, we want the silence between songs to live on the previous song so that when you skip right to this song it starts up right away um, now there's i might as well talk about that as you can see it, it made markers the cd wizard made markers at the start of each clip plus they were quantized to the nearest cd frame which is why the markers didn't get inserted exactly at the start of each clip if i would have turn this off, which I guess I can, let me, and this is kind of what I touched on with the first demonstration. If I turn quantize off, now it's going to make a marker or a splice marker at the, right at the start of each clip. Um, again, I, I'm a fan of quantizing because you just never know when a client's going to decide to make CDs or burn CDs from the WAV files just for listening. Uh, you just I think it's a good practice to quantize the markers, except for special cases. But as you'll see, this is not really a great si situation because the first marker is not at 0, 0.0. .0 uh, and the other markers are too close to the first note. So we have a feature called Move Multiple Markers, which of course I have a shortcut for, but um, that's how you find it in the markers tab and I, I have a lot of presets as you can see um, this is the one I use most of the time I have one that doesn't quantize for when I'm doing singles but there's a main version instrumental TV mix acapella in those cases I don't want to quantize I, it's, it's a long story but just use the one with quantize because what this is going to do is it's going to move the markers backwards in time by 200 milliseconds plus quantize it to the nearest CD frame. And it's only going to move this first start marker and it's only going to move all the splice markers. It's not going to move the end marker because we don't want the end marker to move backwards because that could then cut off a little bit of a reverb. We just don't want that one to move. We'll look at it. Um, we'll look at that one specifically and decide what needs to happen but this is the setting i use for move multiple markers and watch what happens the marker jumps back now the cool thing is is this clip and i may have done this on purpose subconsciously uh, because the first clip started at about 195 milliseconds the first marker even though we told it to move 200 seconds it just goes to zero because it can't go any further back and also before i forget you know cds need to have this two second pre-gap before the first track. You don't have to worry about that in WaveLab. It takes care of it by itself. So zero is zero seconds. When you make a DDP, it'll put that two second pre-gap in there for you. You just don't have to think about it. It's not, you don't have to worry about starting your montage at two seconds and having that. It just does it for you. So my point is now marker number one is at zero. If my, um, if my, if I would have decided to put the first song at 400 milliseconds and I run the CD wizard to get my markers and I run move multiple markers to do what I just showed you. You can see that that's not enough for the first song. I have to manually drag it to zero or enter in zero, but for the others, we'll say that's okay. You know, to have it 200 milliseconds between the start of the track and the first note is 
for me works for most projects. If you get a song with a really ambient fade in, and I've, that's not even that ambient, but just to make a point, if, if you have a song that has a really gradual fade in from nothing, 200 milliseconds might be, be either not necessary or too much because it's going to feel like it's too long before the song really started. So sometimes with ambient fade-ins, I might just put the marker right at the start of the clip because the first 200 milliseconds or so are going to be so quiet. That's not the best example, because, but you get the idea. So anyways, we can check our markers and see if they're in a good place, you know, which I think they are. I, I, I did that one like that on purpose. And then our last marker, you know, is good. You know, you if it's a, because this is a, such a slow ending, if you have a really abrupt ending song, you may want to back up your marker a little more. And then what you can do is if you've moved your markers around manually, you can always go to my preset that says quantize only. That way you're not generating or moving markers. All this with this setting, it's only going to quantize the markers. So, and you can tell because it changed to red there. So um, sometimes I like to look at the last marker and decide if it's good as is or if it feels too close. So we want to add a little breath at the end of the record. Um, but that's basically how I get the markers created and added. Now you can see, um, because maybe this is more of an in-the-box mastering situation or whatever, the, uh, the markers are named terribly. Um, so we, this is, again, where we want to name the markers the exact song title. And again, I don't use the clips. I don't rename the clips because I always want to know if it's Mix 4 or Mix 3 or whatever. The markers is really where you want to rename it because... Um, as I mentioned, if you watch my videos, if you get the markers name correctly, then all your meta, you only have to enter the stuff in one time and then all your metadata, CD text, everything's just perfect. You just have to deal with it once. So I'm going to copy these in and they're out of order because I just made this up, but it is kind of from a real project, but for this fake project, the songs are in a different order than, uh. than they appear. So just give me a minute here to finish this up. And I kind of picked this one on purpose. Um, it's a bunch of cover songs, but the reason I picked it is because this, the way this came into me, and you're going to experience this, is all these apostrophes are a weird format. You can kind of tell, notice how it looks now. It's like really curvy. That's how it came into me from how they typed it. Maybe they're on Windows. I really don't know. But now that I've got my markers named perfectly, we go to the CD text phase. And even if you're not making a DDP, this is still stuff I do for metadata file naming purposes. So my whole point is just get it right once from the start and you don't have to think about it again. So I have a button on my Stream Deck that does this really fast, but I basically just copied the montage name and then opened the CD text editor because, again, the montage name for me has the artist name and album title in it, so that's a good way. I, I just, I copy and paste whenever I can. I, I try to never type anything because then uh, you don't make any spelling mistakes. So we've got the, ar the album title and the artist name in there. We're going to use this button to push the artist name to all the tracks. We're going to go to track one and push the marker names to all the CD text. And as you can see, I did this one on purpose. The first song's fine. You'll see that instead of saying I'm alive, it says I question mark am alive, which is kind of funny. But you have to go there and manually type in an apostrophe on your keyboard. Um, this doesn't happen all the time. I'm not saying this will happen for every project, but occasionally it will happen where the commas that exist in the file name or the marker name come from something else that is not native to your situation. So I've just corrected those errors. I also like to put the cursor at the end of the title and make sure there's no spaces like this because it's easy to, it's easy to, uh, miss things like that. So I just zoom way in and go quickly through to proof everything. Um, so now we got our, um, now we got our markers and CD text done. Let me go back to the ISRC database and grab a 
code. And this is where you can do it later too. Let's say you, for whatever reason, you didn't do it right away. Maybe the client sent it to you later, or you just forgot. You can open the CD wizard and choose ISRC only, paste in the first code, hit apply. And then we have all the codes in order if, if that's how it ends up working out. So as I mentioned, um, this audio is 24 bit. And this might be fine for rendering, rendering your 24-bit 44.1 waves of each song, which can be used for digital distribution or Bandcamp, um, all sorts of things. Uh, there's no need to reduce to 16-bit for those situations. But if you do need to make a DDP, this would be a time to add a dither plugin. And you probably noticed I ha I've had the master section hidden. And even for this case, I'm, only, I'm not going to use the master section. I'm going to go to the inspector output i'm just going to add a dither plugin in fact i have a preset for it 16 bit um, so now you can see that when i play the audio it's going to show as 16 bit if i bypass the plugin it's the, the source audio is 24 bit if i decided to tweak this song down a half a db it's floating point no big deal because we're going to dither to 16 bit but you know if, if you we're going to render 24-bit waves of these. You would, in my opinion, want to render at least dither this song back to 24-bit because otherwise you're going from floating point to 24-bit, which may or may not be a concern, but uh, you should at least be aware of it because um, I think it's, it's important to be aware of it. Whether or not it's a problem you want to address is a different story, but I think some people don't realize that regardless of the file 16 or 24 bit, any processing makes it floating point and you have to decide if you want to manage it. But anyways, I've inserted my 16 bit dither because we're going to render a DDP here because that's what this video is about. Everything's good. Again, I like to double check by making sure my first marker is at zero and just quickly skimming through it and make sure, you know, there's not a marker that's in the middle of a note or something's gone wrong. So again, then you would render this. And you can pick the folder. And again, I'm making stuff up here, so I'm a little out of sorts. But I would do something like this. I like to avoid spaces in the names if you can, because sometimes that trips things up. So then we just press OK. This one's going to take a little longer, because again, it, the dither plugin, plugin is running live on this render. It's a shorter album, so it probably took about the same. But my point is, it didn't zip as fast, because this plugin is running live. And it, yeah, of course, you always want your dither to be last. You know, if for some reason you decided to add a limiter, Look what happens after the dither, it's floating point, so you you wouldn't want to do that. The dither should really always be last, including after sample rate conversion, which is, interestingly enough, my next and final topic. We're going to kind of do a faster one again where the file... I'm not going to have to do any editing, but we're going to do a situation where the files are 96K, and I'm going to show you a way to um, create a DDP from that. You know, because one way could be, again, I, I don't work this way because I like to be more efficient and just assemble things once and only dither once and blah, blah, blah. But I've seen cases where people have 24-bit 96K master wave files, and now they need to make a DDP suddenly. And that's kind of a tricky situation because you've already... Um, you know, we assume you've already converted your floating point processed audio to 24-bit. Now you're going to, in theory, increase that 24-bit audio to floating point and then go to 16-bit. So that's, that's kind of a lot of up and down. Whether it has audible artifacts or impact, you know, you could debate that on the internet all you want. But I, I like to just dither once, so I don't do it that way. But I have seen people 
in that situation. So that's what I want to show you how to navigate that situation if you have to, even though I don't do that. So I'm going to make a 96K montage. And aside from everything I just told you about that, the way that Wave Lab works with the master section is not my favorite as well. So there's kind of two negatives to doing it that way. But let's say you have your master 96K waves and you need to make a DDP. I'll show you how to do it. Again, my default montage template um, is 96K. So I've done that. I'm going to load in the files. And we'll assume that these five files don't need any song spacing, kind of like the first thing I showed you. You know, these would be the high resolution digital masters for streaming. You know, we're not going to touch any, we're not going to touch them or anything. So that's again where I would use the tracks method, line up on the same track. So it looks like that. We have to save it as something. So we'll call it higher sample rate will be the artist name DDP time is the album name so and I'll play the audio to show you these are 24 bit waves 96k as you can see here all the all the buffer and song spacing is built in uh, there's you can tell I mastered this because there's 200 milliseconds before that first sound whatever that is and actually, I think this album had a cross-faded song too, but you know, we have our silence built in to the end of the file, and then we have about 200 milliseconds before the first note. Yeah, these two songs actually ran together, um, and these two songs were just normal spacing. As you can see, zoomed way in. These had a tight transition, and there's the end. So again, um, actually, let me do something I just to show you what I mean. Pretend you didn't see this, but I'm going to move this file. So now everything's after song one, nothing's quantized to the, to the CD frames anymore, but just pretend you didn't see that. Um, so now I'm going to do the same thing with the CD wizard. Again, I have a shortcut, which is control C that I've custom made, but if the slow way is to go to the CD tab and press the CD wizard, um, button which uh is that one actually i pretty much always use this starting point with the exception of you know adding codes i'll skip adding well maybe i won't let's say we want to add our isrc codes just for whatever reason if you know them ahead of time you can do that easily i don't do any of this stuff with marker naming and i don't want it to adjust gaps because I, I always do that man i always do that by ear i don't want it to change any i don't want it to move any audio basically so I keep all this stuff off, and this is the setting I use. So the reason I told, the reason I moved those clips and told you not to look at it was because now you can see when I zoom in, I told it to make the markers right on the CD frame, and it did. That's why it's not at the start of the clip for these other songs, including that one that crossfaded. We'll just pretend that. So my point is, I think it's good to. Um, this, I guess this is a good example. It's good to know where the markers are going to um, quantize to when you make the, you know, if you make, if you don't quantize your markers and you make the DDP, it's going to quantize it for you during that process. So you may as well get ahead of it and know where it's going to quantize to. And maybe you decide that this is a better place for the marker. Now this kind of makes my head explode because if you do it just for the DDP, then it's going to be different than your master wave files for distribution and, you know, the world is going to end. Not really, but that's why I kind of don't work this way. But let's just say for whatever reason, we want to move that in a better spot. So again, um, these files were named with numeric prefix, but we want to actually get that out of the marker name, which you can, of course, do manually by um, typing. That's a slow way. Um, you can um, batch rename the markers and get rid of that numeric prefix. Now again, when when I'm when all is said and done, and I render a wave of each track, my render settings for that, they'll add the numeric prefix back. But we don't want that in the marker names because we don't want it to be 
in the CD text names either. Um, so I think I've explained this enough times to just go fast and not show you. I still like to check it all and make sure there's no spaces or weird character changes. Um, but as you can see, it's 96K. I can even show you, I can close this. I can even show you on my audio device settings. We're using this RME card. It's showing 96K sample rate. Um, that's fine, but a DDP needs to be 44.1 sample rate. So if I were to go to render a DDP, it's going to give me this warning. Um, actually, hold on a second. It gave me a different warning because uh, we we're trying to write to a different file. Again, I'm all out of sorts here, so give me a break on this. But now it should give me a warning, yes, that the audio montage's sample rate is not 44.1. Uh, so it's telling you to use the master section resampler to set it to 44.1. And that you may want to add a peak limiter and dithering after that, which I agree with. So let's talk about that. Um, the master section is not something I care for in WaveLab, but that's just a personal preference. You may like it. Um, the reason I don't care for it is because if you're not careful, these settings are not saved and loaded with your montage. You have to kind of manually save and load them. So I try to keep all my plugin work in the inspector for clip effects for each song, track effects for each montage track, which don't get used a lot, and then um, montage output effects for the very last stuff, like a final limiter, dithering, and stuff like that. But as I mentioned, this I'm kind of doing thing, showing you some ways to work in a different way, because not everyone likes to work how I do, and I understand that. So Let's say you have these 96K files and you need to make a DDP. Um, I've showed you all the, none of that other stuff changes as far as CD text and markers. That's been, we've gone over it twice now. All that's in place. But what we do need to do is activate the resampler. So in the master section, and if I have a special layout, your, your version may look like this. So let's just work like this for the rest of the video. Um, the master section has effect slots. We're going to ignore those for this. We are going to activate the resampler. The green, the green icon is there now, and you can choose a variety of sample rates. But since we're making a DDP, we would want to choose 44.1. And now, when I hit play, let's check out my sound card. It has changed to 44.1 sample rate. So now we know that we're listening through the resampler. It's going through the resampler. It's active. Um, you know, the resampler doesn't have any meters, so it's kind of hard to tell what, what's going on there, but it, it is resampling to 44.1. The montage is still going to say 96 because that's what it, the actual montage is. The master section is after the montage, and as I mentioned, not necessarily part of the montage. Um, an interesting thing happening here, um, if you... If we analyze this file, we can see that the digital and true peaks are not hitting zero. They're under, they're not clipping, they're safe. But watch what happens. And watch, we can even see down the meter when I turn the resampler off, there's no clipping occurring on any of these meters. When I turn the resampler on, suddenly we're going to get some overs and that's because changing the sample rate can affect the peak levels by a fraction of a decibel which is not a big deal when you're well under zero but when you're so close to the digital ceiling like we are in mastering quite often um, now it's spilling over zero and whether or not that's a problem that needs to be solved is up to you i i know a lot of masters just clip at zero and people just they don't mind the sound of it. It can get a little crunchy, but some sometimes that's part of the sound. Um, there's no right or wrong answer, but you should be aware of it that um, downsampling or resampling is going to change the peak level a little bit. 
and that's precisely why the final effects and dithering slots exist. But that's also why I work like I do, because as I told you, I render the whole thing first at a high sample rate, and then I can um, do an external sample rate, and then I can check my file. This one's going to take a little while because it's a long one, but it'll let me explain. I can check my down sample and then decide if I have any overs that I want to address and care about, or if sometimes the down sample, the 44.1 is clean, but if you're doing it live while you're rendering your DDP, you'll never know. This allows me the opportunity to check this whole file before I make my 44.1 versions, whether it's 44.1 waves or DDP. I like to know what's going on and decide if I need to address it before I render it. Whereas in this scenario, when you're going right from 96 to 44.1 using the resampler, unless you sit here and play the whole montage and watch it, then you're kind of, you don't know what clipped until it, it happened. It's a very, um, I think a very slow, inefficient way to do it, but I don't want to get too far off track. Um, so I don't want to get off track, but anyways, the, um, the resampler, and then we have the final effects and dithering slots. Now, there's kind of two slots only on purpose, because you may or may not want to add a true peak limiter here. And then, of course, you want to add the dithering last. Wait, you know, Even if you tell WaveLab to render 16-bit waves or a DDP, it's not going to apply dithering for you. It'll truncate it to 16-bit if you're not dithering, but it's not going to hold your hand and magically dither for you. You always have to be very deliberate about what you're doing. So there's two slots here for a reason. Uh, you know, Steinberg has the brick wall limiter. I really like to use this one. Um, and in this case, I would set it to minus 0 0.1. With these particular settings, this is the Tokyo Dawn True Peak Limiter. And what I like about this is it's not lowering the audio by 0 0.1 decibels. It just has a ceiling of 0 0.1. It's not changing the gain of the file. The only thing it's doing is occasionally grabbing some peaks, which you might see this meter flicker. On a, you can barely see it. There it goes. The other cool thing is it has a delta mode, so I can actually listen to just the true peaks that it's catching, and it'll just be a little tick, tick, pop kind of thing. Now, if I lower this really low, it's going to go crazy, and it, that's obviously too much. But I really like this true peak limiter, and it's cool. It has a lot more features and modules, but I have everything turned off except what you see here, and it's really clean and effective, and it's a great affordable plugin for this purpose. Um, so this, as you can see, now that we've applied this, let me reset the meters, even though we're resampling and even though we were getting some peaks over zero before, we're not anymore because of the this particular limiter and this particular setting, which I'll take it out of delta. Um, but as you can see, um, our bit depth meter is reading floating point audio because A, we are resampling and B, we have this true peak limiter that's catching some stray peaks. So now we need to address the dithering situation. Um, WaveLab comes with the um, Lin Dither plugin, new to WaveLab 11. Um, to be honest, I just haven't had much time to spend with it because I'm so busy mastering or doing these videos. Um, you can insert any dither there, and if you're not seeing your dither of choice, you can go into the preferences, plugins, and you just have to go and enable it. This is called the final effects dithering, so you go to the final column and just make sure you add it with the checkbox. And then you can, you know, some people think with some of these slots you can only have certain plugins there, but you just kind of have to manually, you know, I don't use Sonarworks, a lot of people use Sonarworks. By default, it doesn't show up in the playback processing, but you can go and enable it, and it's fine. So um, that's something to be aware of is um, adding your own custom plugins there. Let me just get this ready. Okay, so now we've done, I think, all the things we need to do. We've resampled the 44.1, which we're monitoring. Um, we have the peak limiter 
to catch any peaks that it might be spilling over zero. We have the dither to 16. Well, I think I was talking and forgot, but I like this dither plugin as well because it has its own built-in bit depth meter that, of course, matches Wave Labs. So now we're all set. I don't know why that peaked, but maybe it had something bypassed. Well, this is actually, because I have this little teardrop, this is monitoring its own version of True Peaks, whereas this is monitoring digital peaks, and True Peaks are somewhat of an opinion, but it's good to have some, it's good to have some True Peak limiting in place. Um, so whether or not you want to set that to minus 0 0.2 is your personal choice. Again, why I like to work the other way is where I can actually see the real results and manage it myself. Um, but anyways, we are now ready to render a DDP from these 96K waves. And uh, I think I already entered this in before. One thing I like about this is we can always just tweak characters. If this was version 2, I could just change the 1 to a 2. Um, since I don't use the master section, I always have this um, checked so that I'm not accidentally rendering audio through the master section, even though I keep it set flat and to nothing. Um, but in this scenario, I would want to uncheck that box. I'm just mentioning it in case you're using my preferences. You would want to uncheck that box because we actually need, we, we need the master section in this case. And before I forget, the other thing I don't care for with the master section is now that I've done all this, I have to press this little star, save the master section, and as you can see it says, this preset will be saved inside the montage. And I can save it, but now if I open a different file, this master section is now working on that file, and it might not have any... I don't want the, those settings for this montage, so just remember that the master section is like its own separate thing and you have to save and load it separately. So let's say I closed this and did some other stuff and even cleared the master section. And now I come back to this project. The master section doesn't do anything. You know, so none of that stuff is there. You have to go to the star, load the master section preset. You have some options, load it. And now everything's back to how it was. I just, that doesn't work for my brain. I need everything to be in the montage. So I don't use the mask. Uh, that's kind of a third reason why I just do things the way I do it. But again, this is, I'm trying to be open-minded here. So we have everything set how we want. We're lowering the sample rate, doing the peak, true peak limiting, which is optional, doing the dithering. Now we can make the DDP. And this process is new because... I believe that it's doing the uh, you know the resampling and any plug-in processing that needs to happen first, and once this completes, then it's gonna, then it's going to show you the DDP rendering screen. So while this is doing it, I'll just summarize by saying that's how you would do it if you just only care about DDP and you have existing files. But if you kind of watch some of my other videos, you don't have to stress out about this part because you already have. A montage that is perfectly named, laid out, all that stuff. And just whether you render waves or a DDP, it doesn't even matter. It's it's just the press of a button at that point. Everything's organized and arranged how you want it. But um, just to kind of close this out, I can show you that folder. I think I called it high sample rate version two. Um, and again, there's your files that you'd zip up and send off to your client or to the CD manufacturer. I like to use the HOFA DDP player maker because it the player allows burning of CDs. Some of my clients still like to burn CDs and it actually embeds the player right inside the DDP folder. So for example, when the client downloads this, uh, pretend I'm the client, they download the DDP the player folder exists in there. It doesn't do any harm. You just click on it. This is just a two song project, but you get the idea. You can have your studio logo. They can burn CDs. You can turn burn CDs off. It's a little more flexible, but if you need a simple DDP player, the Steinberg one is free on the website. It lets you at least play the audio and export waves. 
Um, I think we're going to wrap this up because it's been over an hour. That should cover most DDP assembly questions and needs. Um, if you are just looking at WaveLab as a DDP tool and not trying to uh, do a lot of stuff. But if, for those that are new to this, if you go to wavelabhelp.com, that's a website I have. You can rewatch all these videos. You can download all my presets and settings. And you can consider working in a way that makes your life a little bit easier where you just have one source montage at the high resolution, high sample rate, and you can use a combination of rendering and custom montage duplicate and external sample rate to kind of work your way down to 44.1 and have just more control over what's going on. Because even if you, um, you know, if you need, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, it just gets complicated if you render 24-bit waves of this and then you want 44.1 versions and you're really messing with the bit depth up and down and all around and um, the way that I do it just means that you're only dithering once only assembling once only naming things once uh, in my opinion it's and then it opens up the ability to once the mastering is approved then you just have to go to the source montage and branch off for your vinyl versions or your instrumental versions um, in my opinion, it just makes life easier. It, it does require thinking bigger picture. It does require some, you know, learning. But once once you get fast at it, it's I, I wouldn't really want to work any other way. So it looks like there's no other questions. So I'm going to wrap it up here. Again, wavelabhelp.com. It's a good resource. We have a WaveLab users group on Facebook if you want to join that. And the WaveLab forum on the Steinberg website is also a great resource you can interact with the, one of the main developers of wavelab get questions answered um, and at most mastering that might be a good topic to have somebody on this podcast or not podcast this live stream uh, to talk about it wavelab currently doesn't support atmos that could change in the future uh, we'll see if atmos becomes more in demand or fades away but anyways thanks for watching all this if you have any questions, just head over to one of the websites or forums and we can ask additional questions and have a great evening.